Okay, let's get started again. Um, we have four talks. They're 20 minutes each. Uh, the general format is 12 minutes for a talk, eight minutes for questions. Uh, NASA Hurricane Center is actually reporting for two centers, so we've given them 15 minutes for the talk and um, five minutes for questions. Okay. Okay, so rapid intensification change is our number one uh, issue. Uh, we've noticed that tropical cyclone track forecasts, especially when they're related to uh, storm structure. I'll show an example for uh, Joaquin this year where uh, it was particularly relevant. Uh, and then to look at uh, tropical cyclone genesis. Uh, over the last couple of years, we started issuing five-day genesis forecasts. Uh, and there's been a, a degradation in some of the GFS forecasts that we've noticed uh, that have impacted operations. So run through the Atlantic and the East PAC numbers for track. So 2015 is on the left, uh, the three-year sample is on the right. First thing that, stop, uh, that stands out is that the, the European center was, was by far the best model for the Atlantic Basin uh, for 2015. Um, the GFS, uh, the blue, and then the GEFS, uh, the, the, the dotted light blue line, uh, kind of a similar performance. Uh, and over a longer term, uh, it's kind of a step below. Um, the, a step below the European. There was a time that the GFS and the European were a lot closer to neck and neck in terms of uh, tropical cyclone Atlantic forecast. Uh, but with the, the forecast skill of this year, the, um, uh, the, the European leads the way. Uh, and uh, the ATORF, uh, the, the pink, and, and the, um, the, the GFDL uh, lag behind the rest. Switching into the Eastern Pacific, just want to show it's kind of different different basin. Uh, the European uh, center is still the best model, uh, but it's not as good as the model consensus. Uh, and kind of in that, in that part of the world, taking consensus of the models is really uh, almost always your best forecast. Uh, GEFS, GFS, very similar performance. Uh, over the longer term, the, the ensemble GFS is actually probably better than, than the control run, and then the H4 uh, and the GFDL, uh, GFDL like behind all of the models. Uh, and the uh, over uh, a longer sample now, it's the first time I've seen that the H4 is competitive with the GFS at days three, four, and five in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, a quick look at intensity. Uh, 2015, uh, BJ showed this uh, slide earlier. Uh, the H4 was the, the best model at about uh, days two, three, and four. Uh, bravo. It got Joaquin uh, very good and propelled it to a, a win uh, for this season. Uh, the GFDL. Um, uh, he really had some struggles this year. Uh, wasn't uh, wasn't one, of, one of our useful guidance at all. And over the long haul, the um, Bravo, the HORF is really becoming our best Atlantic guidance. You can see that the pink line is consistently, uh, it, it has some uh, some early issues, but then uh, $36 and the $96 is the best model. Uh, so that's, that's a success story for sure. In the Eastern Pacific, uh, not as good here. Uh, the HORF has a pretty significant uh, low bias, as did the GFDL, and consequently really lagged behind the rest of the guidance. The, uh, the GFDL uh, had a higher uh, low bias uh, and really struggled. The skill here was, was actually pretty high if you look compared to, uh, compared to uh, decay shippers. So, the, so we actually had a lot of skill this year, um, which was good, but the, the HORF, uh, you know, as as the season wore on, forecasters were able to recognize that there was a pretty big uh, HOR bias and to kind of use that to your advantage. Uh, but it, it took some time to figure that out. Uh, so switching to Genesis forecast, another one of our challenges. So here are the side-by-side uh, -side comparisons of, of a seven-day loop uh, every 12 hours, focusing on the time of Genesis. So what each model, the, the DFS and the European was forecasting. So you see right off the bat, the European is forecasting uh, a more cyclonic circulation and shows genesis uh, roughly a day earlier uh, than the GFS, uh, which eventually does show genesis, was kind of right at, right at the last minute. Um, this uh, was a big problem this year. Uh, the 2015, the, the high upgraded, the, the newly upgraded GFS was, uh, in many respects, in many respects, a disappointment for genesis, uh, especially in the Eastern Pacific. It missed many, um, it missed many uh, cases there. Uh, and there used to be a time where forecasters were very comfortable saying, well, if the GFS and the European were both showing it, uh, we should probably go high, you know, a high probability of genesis. 
Nowadays, you almost don't need the GFS because it's missing a, a lot more systems. Um, so taking the next question, uh, does it help us address the challenges I've talked a little bit about? Uh, yes and no. Um, the, the GEFS that we just had, uh, one of our longer-term goals is to issue day six and seven uh, track and intensity forecasts. Uh, the, the track guidance for the GEFS, uh, the new implementation last week, uh, was definitely disappointing. The Genesis forecast uh, skill degradation that we've noted in 2015 uh, was, uh, was not good. Uh, the intensity guidance, the HWARF, is, is getting better and better, uh, but we still have this huge problem of rapid intensification uh, that I'll show. So, so here's the, the GFS versus the new GFS. Uh, so the, the new GFS, the one that was just GEFS, sorry, the ensemble, that was just, just implemented is in blue. Um, so early on, it, it's a little bit better, uh, but then in day six and day seven, uh, and this is for a very large, uh, a very large sample. Uh, it's degraded on both uh, both accounts. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, you know, disappointing. Uh, if you look at these degradations, they're on the order of 10%. Uh, considering the track forecast improve about 3% a year, it could be a three or four a three or four year. Um, it could hurt us for roughly three or four years uh, if that reduction in skill if that uh, reduction in skill isn't regained. And uh, as also noted, it's also kind of similar to the GFS, uh, a little bit better in the short term and then much worse uh, longer out. Now, here's a diagram of, uh, in 2015, the Eastern Pacific and the Atlantic uh, Genesis. And this is using the calibration from uh, the Florida State, Supra, uh, the Florida State uh, Technique, uh, Dan Halfren, our JHC project. And they're able to give us objective guidance um, for, uh, uh, for the GFS on systems base. And this year, um, they ran it on the reruns that were given the, 20, uh, the 2011, the 2014 uh, sample reruns, uh, but we couldn't, uh, we couldn't come up with a scheme to account for its uh, under forecast uh, bias. And you can see here uh, very notable biases and under predictions for both the Atlantic uh, and the Eastern Pacific. Uh, so uh, a setback. Uh, sit back in that guidance for sure. Um, and I'm kind of echoing the, the same theme as I've heard a few, uh, a few people say. Uh, yes, there's a lot of guidance, but I would still say argue there's not enough skillful guidance. I haven't even talked about uh, tropical cyclone structure, but there's very little in intensity uh, structure uh, information that is uh, useful. And there's a great need for ensemble-based uh, guidance for track intensity and genesis forecast. Uh, we do very little in, uh, utilization of the, the GEFS and European ensemble data uh, for, for genesis. Uh, and it's, a, it's an area that uh, has a lot of potential to be mined. And uh, the hurricane, uh, the HR ensemble, uh, also appears to be, um, has some promise for the intensity and track forecast but we hardly see it in operation. I mean, it, I, we do have the capability of seeing it, but it hasn't been fully integrated in the operation. And there's some time delays uh, that, that keeps it from being as timely as, uh, as some would like. Uh, here's a series of, of, uh, of the, skillful, the skillful models uh, for intensification of uh, Patricia. Um, with a variety of solutions, and you can see, you know, right off the bat, uh, <laughs> right off the bat, it's way, way underdone. Uh, it's not even close. Not even in the, uh, not even in the ballpark. Uh, and disappointingly, the, the statistical models outperform uh, the dynamical models. You can see a lot of these cases, both uh, the GFDL basically flatlined, uh, while while Patricia was undergoing one of the fastest intensifications we'd ever seen. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of work to be done here with the intensity change guidance. Uh, and Joaquin, it's worth spending a minute or two talking about the, um, the ensemble guidance. Uh, so for Joaquin, uh, here's at Genesis, near the time of Genesis, and uh, the orange members of the GSS ensemble and the, the pinkish members of the European ensemble. Uh, you can see very few of the members uh, actually took it as far as that. Uh, if you actually did a, a, a composite of these members by intensity, we could actually have seen, if we were smart enough to do that in real time, some of the stronger members were farther south. 
uh, but they weren't nearly as strong. You're talking about the differentiation between tropical depression and tropical storms. None of them, for instance, had category four hurricanes. Uh, so there's a severe underdispersion uh, problem there. And then the next day, if you compare the GSS ensemble, uh, showing a distinct, uh, a distinct uh, threat to the United States uh, versus the European ensemble, uh, yes, the European ensemble is, is clearly better. Um, it, it, it shows many more, uh, much more of a risk toward the Bahamas. Uh, but in both cases, um, a significant amount of members are, are in this vicinity. And as a result of some of these ensemble forecasts that we were looking at real time, in the, GF, the European operational ended up having about a 12-mile air uh, at, at four days. And, some people look at it and say, why even look at a, an ensemble when consistently it had the forecast in this vicinity? Uh, and that's just one of the operational challenges is knowing how to use this ensemble data um, correctly. Uh, so for the next one to two years, we need, uh, we need more time for the model implement, uh, to evaluate models. Uh, we have to uh, stress how important it is to test the impact of the GFS on the H4 from the GFDL. Um, that, uh, that undoubtedly uh, hurt the model for the upcoming, uh, for the, the last hurricane season, uh, and it's something that we really didn't know at the time. Um, we need more track and genesis forecast improvement. Uh, we're going toward uh, pre-genesis tropical cyclone watches and warnings, and we need better guidance. Um, the, the 2015 GFS is not, uh, was not very helpful in that regard. Um, uh, BJ talked about the, the, the GFDL replacement plans coming up, and we'll need the regional hurricane models run to seven and a half days uh, to support the, the seven-day guidance. And, and talking, taking a look at kind of the, the big wish list, um, we need uh, a, a whole litany of things. Um, the high-resolution, non-hydrostatic, all sorts of tropical cyclone forecast models um, for that have more realistic TC uh, structures. Um, the operate the HR ensemble seems like it's going to be a, a useful tool for us. Um, the verification of genesis skill uh, for uh, that needs to be part of uh, of our uh, uh, thumbs up thumbs down process on the model. It's too important of our forecast now to not look objectively how well the model does with genesis. Um, I didn't have the time to talk about it, but there's a, a Marchock, a Tim Marchock and Peng have two um, tools that you can look at Genesis with, uh, but we really need to unify those uh, techniques and, and try to provide a number for forecasters uh, to look at. And we really need the, the day six, you know, we're pushing toward the day six and seven track intensity and Genesis uh, forecast eventually, uh, and we need more uh, skillful guidance uh, in that. Regime. And I don't think I have time to go through uh, a lot of the stuff from the Joint Typing Warning Center has, but it is very similar. Uh, the, all the slides are, are, are online. The intensity forecasting, uh, they have decision support requirements. Uh, one that they had uh, particularly that I thought would be good to end on, uh, that for the ensemble, for the people in this room, that the model developers, the idea of keeping the number of, of in types of products uh, simple enough to be understood while being high quality and relevant to the problem of the day. That's actually very important. Uh, that's something that's very difficult, um, difficult to do. Any questions for our speaker? Um, in Joaquin, um, what caught a lot of attention and criticism, justifiably, in my opinion, was issuance of a cone of uncertainty based on statistics only, which was totally irrelevant to the model ensembles which were available. I just don't understand how a product like that could go out without you being embarrassed about it. Um, it seems to me you could 
you could draw in a cone of uncertainty, which would have made more sense. I'm sure I'm not the only first person you've heard with this criticism. There are definitely efforts to be uh, to move toward a, a smart cone based upon uh, forecast uncertainty of the available model guidance. Um, but as we saw uh, with the, the with the examples I showed in Joaquin, if one looks at the GSS ensemble, uh, it did not adequately resolve that. You didn't know that at the time until it verified. Um, correct. And if we've been putting a smart cone together, perhaps it would have been even worse. We just don't have enough confidence in our ensemble and our spread guidance to be doing that. Uh, hi, Eric. This is Eugene from uh, Demo Team. Yeah. Uh, I saw you have a request for the original system around to seven and a half days. I'm particularly interested in the, if the global system, the GFS or GFS, cannot give you the good guidance out to the day five, six, seven, do you believe that we run the original system will give you the advantage of that one? Yeah. Well, we've had great success in, in the multi-model consensus. Uh, and the h -warp has been a, a, a big reason why uh, some of the intensity uh, gains that we've seen, uh, especially at, at days two and beyond. Uh, right now, I haven't seen anything that suggests that at day six and day seven, the h -warp, uh and potentially another high-resolution model won't keep adding positively to the global consensus. Any other questions? Okay, let me ask. It seems like in, um, as need to express how significant your results are. What's this NHC's thought on that? I mean, it's random variations from period to period we've seen. How do you access that? Um, it, one, could, one could run a significant uh, test. You know, if you looked at the day six and day seven, uh, it's very, if you combine the Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific for both the GFS and the GFS ensemble, you're getting the same answer regardless. Um, that seems pretty significant, even without those tests you'd be talking about. You could run that test. Any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, climate Prediction Center is next. Uh, and we have, uh, we'd like to have it about 12 plus 8. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Glenn. Um, I'll be giving the... Um, CPC uh, perspective uh, for the meeting here. I want to definitely acknowledge uh, Rune Kumar from our operational monitoring branch, as well as Dave DeWitt and Mike Halpert uh, from CPC. Uh, I think it's important, I'll be brief, but I think it's important to review, again, CPC's responsibility. Uh, it spans um, a number of different areas. Our, our areas are focusing off on the week two all the way up to about a year, so we're, we're in a seamless suite um, plot here. Uh, we're focusing on that red box from uh, week two all the way out to a, a multiple seasons. Uh, we provide temperature and precipitation outlooks for week two, monthly and seasonal, as well as extreme outlooks uh, currently only for the week two period at, at the present time, uh, but also do monthly and seasonal drought outlooks. And once per month, we issue the NSO diagnostic discussion, uh, the forecast for how the NSO state will vary in time. And also with our partners at the National Hurricane Center, we release the seasonal hurricane outlook um, for both the East Pacific and Atlantic basins. But there's another, another component of CPC I think is very relevant to the meeting here uh, is the, we have a whole aspect of uh, real-time climate monitoring that we provide, uh, which relies very much on the analysis systems uh, provided by EMC. We monitor uh, key modes of short-term climate variability. Those are listed there. Uh, this is from the ocean to the stratosphere. Uh, we produce information um, following uh, and so, and the MGO, and other teleconnection patterns such as the PNA and NAO, and very much dependent on uh, real time analysis products uh, for this. Um, and also, uh, this information is important for attribution of uh, observed climate events as well. And just what's shown there, just a few examples. For example, on the left, GODAS, we use heavily for respect to El Nino, uh, shown on the left, and we also have other information uh, from CDAS uh, and also GDAS, and the plot there on the right. Uh, the forecast, the red lines, are from the ensemble GFS. So there's a whole monitoring component as well. As far as our challenges go, um, entering the, the part of the talk where we try to identify some of the challenges and needs we have with respect to EMC. Seasonal forecasting, obviously, is a challenge in general. 
Uh, we're operating in an area where we have a very low signal-to-noise uh, ratio. We're trying to extract what signal we can from, from noise at these time ranges. And one of our biggest challenges is making improvements in seasonal precipitation forecast skill. Um, what's shown here is just one metric of the HIT-based metric, a HIKI skill score. Uh, if you take a look at this overall, um, this uh, skill is indicated by a, a value of zero positive, or you're adding value as, or positive numbers. And you can see overall this is a plot of the last 10 years. Uh, we really have not made that much improvement. We certainly have periods when we have good forecasts. Um, I don't mean to say that. But overall, as improvement over time, um, things have been very, uh, very difficult to achieve, as other speakers have said. So guidance, targeting, improved uh, prediction skill, of course, is, is a need for us as well. Uh, during the past uh, just few months, we've started issuing experimental week three and four outlooks, um, examples that are shown on the bottom. So um, for temperature and precipitation, um, support and forecast guidance from the NEC is critical for this need uh, as well. We'll talk more about that. Uh, with respect to CPC's other challenges moving forward, um, we do meet forecast for mean temperature and total precipitation. Uh, we're being asked to expand more towards extremes, uh, whether it be week two or beyond. A number of questions are shown there that we get asked that we would like to have improved guidance to help us begin to address some of these uh, difficult uh, problems. These include extremes. Uh, for example, will there be a cold air outbreak in the week three and four period in the eastern United States? What are the probabilities for that? Are they distinctly different from climatology? Um, on the right-hand side, uh, getting back to the monitoring side of the house, uh, we face a major challenge in, in discontinuities at times in our analysis systems um, that influence the initial state for reforecast, the hindcast that we use that do impact our forecast. Uh, what's shown here is a jumps uh, in sea ice extent between the CFS, these are differences between the CFSR and the analysis from the National uh, Snow and Ice Data Center. And you can see uh, two specific jumps in 97 and also in 2008. These are all issues that we, that are challenges for us that impact our forecast guidance and the time ranges that we deal with. Um, so as far as answering some of the questions as far as needs, uh, we'll be doing that for the next few slides, starting with the short term. Short term for us begins in week two. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the, for us, we're trying to pro post process information to get as much signal out of the data, model data, as we can. Um, one of the things that EMC has been very great in working towards over the last few years is providing or working towards um, a re forecast available with each GFS cycle. That's critical for us, um, and I think we've made strides in that um, over the last couple of years. For us, I'm um, just repeating the, the minimum requirements that we uh, address with respect to the, the Hamill et al. white paper, with respect to what we would need as far as requirements, 20 years, uh, five members per cycle, um, two cycles per week, meaning on two separate days. This is what we propose. Uh, this is very critical for us for uh, forecast reliability and targeting those extremes, as I mentioned. So a need for us, whether in respect to the guidance, is uh, we have all the guidance we need. This, with every upgrade, upgrade cycle, is critical for addressing uh, targeting extremes in week two or, or beyond. Um, one other issue is model consistency in the initialization system. This is critical for us. Um, if you take a look at plot on, on the right, the lines uh, are the red lines are 2008, 2009, 2010, and this is for a time series difference between day one of the GFS and uh, in situ observations. And it shows a bias, which is, which is fine, but you'll notice the blue lines when we went to the real-time model, differences between the initialization of the CFSR and GDAS during, this is a, a plot showing an average across the southeast United States during the summertime. And we started to see very large biases in temperature very off, right off the bat across that area. And this has been very uh, important for our, predict our forecasters, um, really making the guidance somewhat unusable, unusable in the southeast uh, during the summertime because of some of these biases with regard to our regular temperatures, but also in development of new outlook. As far as week three and four, one of the areas that we feel um, that may help us, uh, you know, entering new territory here is to potentially operationally extend the GFS after 35 days uh, to support these outlooks, uh, potentially one, one time per week. This is certainly um, complementary to the CFS. Um, we use the CFS 45-day runs very heavily and are very appreciative of them. The idea here is that perhaps the GFS may provide a more rapid model upgrade cycle. There's different uh, larger ensemble size potentially, higher resolution, and there's varying uh, degrees of initialization strategies that, could, that they can use in, in discussions about coupling and so on. Uh, the report request requirement uh, discussed for week two 
that would, would apply as well for here. Uh, with respect to um, these two plots on the bottom just show the challenges that we face. This is December, January, and February, uh, week three and four uh, temperature verification and anomaly correlation. And you can see these both this temperature on the left, precipitation on the right. Um, these are the low skill forecasts. This is comparable to other modeling centers. So it shows the uh, challenge that we have. So guidance uh, uh, to improve this uh, will certainly uh, allow us to move forward much more quickly. As far as the seasonal uh, suite, one of the things that was brought up earlier today, uh, one thing that we could really benefit from, we understand the challenges, the very strong challenges with respect to uh, releasing a new CFS version. Um, the cycle less than seven years would help um, us with respect to keeping advances in models and um, updating, you know, improving potentially seasonal forecast scale. Um, also, we need to, uh, to the extent possible, minimize jumps in the analysis system, slowly varying components of, such as land, sea ice, uh, ocean, and so on. Also, um, for us, um, we do official outlooks all the way out to a year. So um, to completely serve the operation outlook at CPC, uh, we would need forecasts that span almost out to as much as 15 months. Uh, forecast frequency could, would be could be negotiated uh, perhaps every five days. Um, and of course, the critical component of this is that the reforecast model and real-time model need to be identical to maintain any bias, uh, to eliminate any biases uh, to the extent possible. And for us, for the seasonal reforecast period of, of at least 30 years um, would be preferred. As far as um, other, one other thing that's very important to us, we understand the challenges and resources. So one, one need we have is not a, uh, a product in any way. It's basically a dialogue. Uh, maintaining a dialogue uh, on the decisions related to the forecast system for model resolution and thermal size and so on would be very helpful for our CPC uh, and I think EMC to develop the system. Uh, also, uh, it was noted by some folks in CPC that maintaining a set of model scripts that could be used for uh, predictability studies and attribution studies could be very helpful to feed back to EMC uh, on the strengths as well as weaknesses of the model and to continue to support uh, real-time monitoring activities, both uh, drought and other, uh, some of the other climate modes I mentioned earlier. And the last slide, one thing that we, that we need um, is improved sea ice-related guidance. We've heard this a few times now. Um, I showed some of the issues with the continuity of the sea ice analysis. Um, so guidance in this area would be a uh, need uh, to move forward in time over the next several years. Also, uh, it's important for uh, EMC to keep in mind as well guidance that would support monthly and seasonal severe weather outlooks with our partners at uh, the Storm Prediction <laughs> Center. And also um, in our strategic plan, which is what's shown there, um, there has been requests or uh, discussion about whether we wanted to extend into monthly forecast beyond the initial first month. Um, and there's a number of options that we could explore there, one of which would be extending the CFS runs that we have um, that are very useful to us, um, potentially out to 105 days that would target this time period. But these are, these are um, issues and um, products that would be uh, considerably down the road. And I pre appreciate your attention uh, to try to answer any questions you, you have. Questions? John, you had some pretty specific requirements for the reforecast data sets in there, you know, 20 years, five members, blah, blah, blah. How did you come up with those numbers? Yeah, it's a very good question. We had a, a team, as part of that white paper, uh, we did a sensitivity study of the existing forecast, and we basically took members out, is it multiple days, for example, or one day a week, two days a week, a certain number of members in and out, and we found that that configuration provided the highest skill for us, forecast skill with our, our metrics in the, in the week two. Um, should you go back one slide? Okay, so the last one. You do know that we CFS runs out to 90 days every cycle, every zero Z cycle. Yes, I want you to win that this morning. So, so it, it's been there for a long time. Okay, any other questions, comments? Uh, John, one, one thing that, you know, as part of the seasonal hurricane forecast team, uh, the uh, the high res CFS runs that uh, are provided to the, to, to the team have been very helpful. Uh, you know, special runs. You know, even though uh, the product is very visible, 
and the guidance that the high-risk CFS has provided uh, ha has been quite useful. Um, is that uh, is there's been some push to have a better guidance for MJO week two, week three. Uh, how does how does this fit into what you guys want to do with the that week two, week three in the tropical convection? Well, I, I think. That's kind of a difficult question to answer. I, I think what I think what you're getting at is um, the existing guidance of the high resolution runs that are used for the hurricane outlook in general. Um, I think that's more of a kind of question between uh, EMC and CPC resource wise uh, two times a year, and I, I don't necessarily have an easy answer for that um, for your question. But I think the guidance from the CFS, which is coupled potentially information from the GFS at various coupling. Um, Initialization method and methodologies uh, may also help with the tropical convection, um, both of those modeling systems. We also use other modeling systems from other centers as well um, that would try to tackle that problem. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the next talk is from uh, the Space Weather Prediction Center, and this will be a remote presentation. George Millwood here at Space Weather Prediction Center. I've also got uh, Rodney Virick with me in the room, um, and uh, Howard Singer as well has just joined us. Um, so just to give you an overview very quickly of the kind of space weather impacts, obviously lots of stuff to do with modern technology, um, aircraft operations, human space flight, GPS, Satellite operations and also very importantly power grid all can be affected by the sun, um, particles from the sun, electric magnetic fields uh, from solar storms uh, impacting on the, uh, the Earth's uh, system. So just to give you an overview of some of the uh, models uh, that we've got, some in op operations, some about to become operational and then some slightly longer term plans. The first line here uh, WSA Enlil dates back operationally to 2012. Um, that's a, a model of the inner heliosphere, so we're actually looking at coronal mass ejections uh, coming out of the sun, measuring velocity and direction and things, and then propagating it through a weather model to see how it would impinge uh, on the Earth, whether, it, whether or not we're going to get hit by one of these large uh, plasma storms. Um, right now we're working on a, a geospace model, and geospace uh, we uh, think of as the magnetosphere, so the wider kind of environment around the Earth. Again, that's when the actual space storm or the CME arrives at Earth. How does it couple into the Earth's uh, magnetic field? Um, that's uh, a project we've been working on with the uh, University of Michigan. Uh, SWMF is the space, model, uh, space weather modeling framework. Uh, and, then, uh, and then further as we move into the future, we're working on a whole atmosphere model, which is to essentially take the GFS and extend that upwards in altitude to include coupling into the ionosphere and the thermosphere. Um, and if I just move forward, here's, a, here's a, just a pictorial representation of exactly uh, what I was just saying, essentially. So the top one shows a CME coming out from the sun, which is the yellow dot in the middle. And there you have a situation where uh, it's directly impinging on the Earth, and the aim is to predict when that would arrive. We can't actually tell a great deal about how the severity of the storm, um, because there are pieces of the magnetic uh, puzzle from the sun that are missing, no notably the, um, the, the inherent direction of the magnetic field within the cloud as it arrives at Earth. But what we aim to do with WSA Enlil is predict the time of arrival and the possibility of arrival, essentially. And with uh, CMEs that have interacted with Earth, we've been doing that with an accuracy of something like plus or minus seven hours, which is kind of where we're aiming to be with that. Um, I'll talk uh, quite a little bit more about the, um, the SWF model, which, uh, which, which is now in the process. It's with, the, with PMB and with the SPARS actually going through the process of bringing it into operations, and it'll be operational in... Uh, early in 2016, and then move on to the ionosphere thermosphere briefly. So I just want to talk about the uh, the Enlil code. Not going to say much about this, just the fact that we are working in collaboration with Air Force Research Lab to improve the WSA uh, background um, to something called uh, ADAPT, which uh, is the Air Force Data Assimilative Photospheric Flux Transport Model. Quite a 
quite a mouthful, but it actually um, models the uh, change of flux on the surface of the sun um, to actually be able to produce a dynamic background. And the second thing about that is to actually uh, uh, put that dynamic background in as the, as the uh, background to Enlil and have a, um, a, a kind of dynamically updating model, which is not how things work at the moment. That implies a completely new CONOPS, and we have a SWPSI high uh, uh, slated for 2016 to be working primarily on this uh, upgrade. If we um, go to geospace, so the space weather modeling uh, framework uh, transition, the uh, NASA CCMC, SWPSI, and model developers um, were, were worked on several models in the time frame up to uh, 2011, 2012. Uh, in 2013 to evaluate models for how they would handle looking at regional uh, magnetic field uh, perturbations within the uh, Earth, uh, on, on the Earth. Um, uh, there was a final report came out from CCMC and SWPSI in uh, August of 2013 that chose the um, SWMF model, so that's where we went. We then have been working since uh, over 2014 with, with Michigan to develop this. Um, into something that can be utilized operationally. Um, the the, the uh, initial operational system has just been handed over to the SPARS actually on October 1, which was a weather service milestone for um, 2015. And we're now looking at getting a formal 30-day evaluation done sometime before the 1st of March. We actually possibly will be ahead of that, um, but that's a date that we've got on our, um, on our quad chart at the moment. And then operational on W cost by the end of March is the idea. And then uh, uh, FY16 involves us here at SWIPSI working on forecast products, both for the forecasters in the, in the Space Weather Forecast Office and for the public. And then as we move beyond, there'll be geospace model upgrades and other numerical improvements. So here's the issue, just to give you a schematic. Uh, the magnetosphere there is the, uh, is the brightly rainbow-colored thing with the, um, the front of the magnetosphere pointing to the left and pointing towards the sun. Um, the basic point is, is that uh, mag dynamic magnetic and electric fields um, that occur when the, the, the sun's uh, magnetic field from uh, a, uh, within a, a coronal mass ejection impinges on the Earth, you get all these induced currents from that system and the induction that occurs actually on the surface of the Earth can uh, lead to large uh, electric currents in power systems and things like that and, and, and problems. So that's what we're wanting to do. At the moment, our current capability is to measure the uh, solar wind as it arrives at the L1 point. We've been using the ACE satellite for this for many years, and now we're about to move forward with the DISCOVER satellite, which was launched uh, in January and is now at the L1 point. Up to this point, we've utilized simple empirical relationships um, with this uh, to come up with a global value for how the um, storm intensity and geomagnetic netic storm intensity would be on Earth. And what we're now proposing to do is to utilize those same solar wind measurements, and this is the bottom panel here. So the proposed system is to use the same so solar wind measurements, but to drive this uh, SWMF three-dimensional time-dependent MHD model in order to give us a, uh, a regional picture of, uh, of what's going on. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, when you see it there, we've got a map of the, uh, the U.S. In fact, actually, I'll just move forward to the next one because this shows an example of a test product that we've been developing um, for SWMF. And here, uh, the bottom line you've got there that, that goes from green at the start and then starts to uh, edge up towards the red is a single value predicted by the model, a single KP value for the Earth. Whereas what you've got on the map there showing across the U.S. is this regional K, regional K product that we're looking at um, that's giving you some more heads-up information about how things are changing in local time and for different, th different um, sectors across the U.S. and across the globe, of course. And this is, um, so here you can see, you know, we've got sevens and eights which um, are uh, manifesting themselves in different regions. And this is a, this is for, actually, there was a, a storm on St. Patrick's Day this year. Now, um, the St. Patrick's Day storm we all know now uh, for this year in space weather circles. So this was an actual modeling that was done at the time. 
that's, a, that's the products we're kind of looking at. So finally, to move on to whole atmosphere modeling from, from the ground to space, the motivation here is to um, have improved uh, forecasts of the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere. The structures in the ionosphere um, can affect radio signals and modify radio transmission paths or block transmission altogether. Uh, changes in total electron content, that's the complete content of the ionosphere, can impact GPS radio navigation. Uh, and ionospheric irregularities can impact satellite communication. And another area, so that's all within the ionosphere, if you like, but the underlying thermosphere density changes through, due to storms and things like that affect um, satellite or orbits uh, by the drag that they actually place on the satellites. Um, so the lower atmosphere, the issue here is the lower atmosphere impo imposes a lot of day-to-day -day variation on the ionosphere thermosphere. Uh, planetary waves, gravity waves, tides propagate upwards into the thermosphere and, and, and generate all sorts of kind of dynamic uh, issues. Sudden stratospheric warmings change global structure. Um, and the lower atmosphere modulates the density of the upper atmosphere and deposits energy and heat in the kind of 100 kilometer range. And just to give you an example here, this is um, uh, uh, an example, and you'll see the altitudes going up to 400, up to 800 kilometers here. These are radio um, radar observations, re radar returns, showing all sorts of ionospheric structures being actually stimulated by um, tropospheric phenomenon. And so that's basically what we're wanting to do. Um, so here's a schematic of, of where we are with GFS. The, the, the GFS uh, on the left, uh, uh, extends to 60 kilometers. We're then wanting to um, couple that to a whole atmosphere model that will take that up to eventually 600 kilometers, which is, can be normally thought of as the top side of the thermosphere. And then beyond that, coupled into uh, an IPE, uh, integrated, um, what's the integrated? Atmosphere plus atmosphere electrodynamics. Ionosphere place. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking of uh, I was thinking of idea, which is another acronym we've got going here. Ionosphere plasmosphere electrodynamics model, which takes you to several thousand kilometers and into the kind of ionosphere and plasmosphere um, parts of the uh, parts of the atmosphere and basically into space. Um, so that's the project we're involved on at the moment. So I now wanted to just uh, finally, this is last, this is my last slide. Just uh, visit the uh, the questions that we were given in the um, the heads up about the meeting. What are the biggest challenges your region centre faces? Uh, basically, uh, we have uh, we're still in the perspective where the current state of knowledge, significant knowledge about the space weather system, still needs to be established. For instance, forecasting of flares on the sun, uh, prediction of protons. And, and very specifically to a lot of what we do, the actual orientation of the, mag the magnetic field coming dynamically out of the sun, which we uh, collectively all talk about BZ. So, uh, uh, and it's Z because it's the north-south component essentially that's important to the dynamics of the system. Um, I've been told that computer resources on the development systems is inadequate, especially for the WAM work we're doing. And uh, we actually have not yet got a permanent allocation on fair. So I'm not quite sure what that means or why that could be. But um, anyway, I was flagging that up. Does the current production suite and products adequately help you address those challenges? It's a start. Um, but what is very, very clear moving forward is we're going to start uh, utilizing more and more computing capacity on WCOS and on the whatever comes after WCOS. So just to look at that, in 2012, we were using two cores. That's what Enlil utilizes, runs every two hours. SWMF in, into operations in 2016 adds another six cores to that at least, uh, to up to eight. This is all small fry in, uh, compared to what a lot of people do. I know that. Um, but then as we move to WAM, WAM is going to be more like 30 to 40 cores, and that is a low-resolution version of GFS. Um, so that could go, that will satisfy our space weather needs at, at first, but uh, um, probably not as we move too far into the future. Um, what will we need in terms of models or products to meet the challenges in the next two years? Support from EMC is up on here, um, and various improvements to the GFS code to actually accommodate the coupling that we're trying to do. And again, um, you know, again, we're going to move to um, more computing power is actually required for what we're doing. From my perspective, working on geospace, 
it would be definitely advantageous to allow developers to have access to the EC flow system on WCOS within development. That's been, I can only ever kind of develop something that's related to the final application. And Geospace is a real-time product, real-time model. It's been hard to kind of visualize what we're trying to build uh, when I only have part of the pieces to deal with. So uh, in the longer term, this is final question. Space weather modeling is obviously in its infancy. We've got one model in operations, one to come, and then more uh, going forward. Um, basically, again, same answer to, this, uh, to what was there before. We need support for this, and we uh, will need more and more computing resources as we move into the future. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions for the speaker? Comments? Um, question. Um, as you mentioned, the impact of the CME uh, is critically dependent upon the orientation of the mag magnetic field of the CME relative to the Earth. And right now, the only way to know that is when it reaches the uh, L1 point as detected by ACE or in the future by DISCOVER, which uh, means there's only one hour or less than an hour warning to whether or not the effect will be diverted around the Earth or have a direct impact on the Earth. <clears throat> now, when you're talking about regional geomagnetic activity, are you talking about determining some aspects of the uh, orientation of the CME prior to its arriving at the L1 point? No. And, okay, so it's talking about deriving information about the regional impact once it reaches the L1 endpoint. Yes, exactly. Let me, let me just but, go uh, back to just, the that here. So it, it still the means, L1 it still point means. makes measurements, yes, an hour when the solar wind's at, say, 300 kilometers per second. If a CME sweeps in, up to that point, we do not really have a great deal of information about the magnetic structure. But we have no information about the magnetic structure, apart from maybe a, the very front shield of it. But yes, we're making direct measurements, and those measurements are then propagated forward in time by that kind of hour, and that gives us the forecast that then can feed into the front end of the MHD model. So that's how it works. How, how can that information be used, practically speaking, relative to, for example, shutting down the power grid with less than uh, an hour's notice, and once these outputs from this model are uh, generated, it's probably minutes. Yeah, it is. In actual fact, that's why we have the model running in a very uh, critical um, time-dependent mode. So in actual fact, yes, we have minutes, and it's generally accepted that uh, the, the final line of defense for the Earth against this kind of storm is going to be 20 minutes away, and, but there is a, um, an ability for the power grids to deal with that directly from uh, warnings that come out from the Space Weather Forecast Office. And uh, there's a lot of things they do. It's not, about, it's not necessarily about shutting the, the grid down. They actually operate with all sorts of contingencies all the time. But they need that heads up. And they'll have a heads up from the annual model that something's arriving. But then you've got that kind of final 20 minutes where, um, uh, it, you know, the various the intensity that they're uh, absolutely about to experience, uh, get that information goes out. But, but yeah, 20 minutes is, um, is kind of what we're working at. And that's why the, the, this model uh, runs in a completely um, real-time mode. So data is coming from L1 all the time into WCOS, and the results are coming back to SWPSI. Uh, you know, the, the model actually keeps up in time with that. George Peter Neely from the Weather Company. If I understood your um, one of your last slides about the computing requirements, um, those were pretty trivial numbers. Uh, eight cores next year and forty something in, the, in, in a couple of years. Is it? Do I understand that right? And if so, is that really a problem? Getting you know, that's the kind of thing you buy in one pizza box. <laughs> well, okay. Um, sure. Well, uh, I, I guess so. I don't know if it's a problem or not. Um, maybe someone else could speak to whether it's a problem. Um, 
Uh, certainly, yes, when you look at two cores or six cores, but these are all running operationally on WCOS, so it's, uh, it's not something we do here locally. It is run at NSAP. Yeah, I, I can comment on that a little bit, this is Hendrik. Um, um, the biggest challenge with, with WAM is that you have to deal with completely different velocity and stability ranges in the high up atmosphere. And so, therefore, the initial attempts at running WAM it's going to be at a much, much lower horizontal resolution, like a T126 or something like that, to get <coughs> to gain the, um, the the experience we need with this model in general. Um, but we do that with the, the, the shared code base, code base, so in that sense we do it unified. The real challenge is going to be to figure out from WAM how much benefit you get from going from 60 to 100 kilometers, the fact that there's quite a bit of satellite data in that area that you may be able to use, and how you technically could integrate this with uh, the full-scale GFS that may require something like a uh, what we call vertical nesting, like a going to a lower horizontal resolution at higher latitude, which is all way further in the future. And this is why uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the slides I showed this morning, I identify WAM as we don't know exactly where it's going to fit yet. But for now, we're looking at a real requirement from, the, from space weather that we are going to <laughs> satisfy for now with the same code base but running it at a much lower resolution. And therefore, it's not really an issue uh, with uh, the quote-unquote pizza box level of, uh, of resources. You, The real challenge is how to integrate this fully later and to see which part of this is going to be uh, essential or relevant for the weather side, the, the traditional weather side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further comments or questions? Yeah, this is Pete. Um, the news is first energy. Um, just wanted to uh, just thank the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center for the products they do produce because we do use those uh, watches and alerts quite a bit. Um, and uh, we're a strong proponent if you are going to, you know, go more graphical in terms with the, um, like that slide there that you have with the uh, the earth on it there on the top left that's minimized, um, we would really appreciate that uh, as, a, as a means to visualize the, you know, the, the areas of most likely impact. You'd be surprised. It's, um, it's one thing. It's already stated in, you know, some of the statements, you know, primary impact expected to be poleward of, you know, 50 degrees, but getting something that's uh, graphically uh, or you can visualize and, and pass along to the um, internal staff is, is much more um, easily assimilated and understood. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, um, one, one of the big uh, parts that I'm playing in this is to develop those, um, those graphical products. So products that are scientifically accurate, but also actually have the heads up meaning that, you know, someone can actually act on this and understand it quite easily from right. across the other side of the room, that kind of thing. So we're actually looking at um, dynamic products for the forecast office itself, but then also probably dynamically generated web products um, to actually give you that. And uh, actually, yeah, the globe you're looking at there could very well, well end up as, um, you know, a product coming out early next year. So. It's surprising how many people don't okay, realize. Um, thank you very much. We need to move on, but that Sorry. was illuminating. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. The next speaker is uh, National Water Center. Okay, so I'll be talking uh, about uh, the National Water Center and how it relates to the NSA production suite. We're a relatively new center. We've only been around for about a year or so, and we're supposed to be between Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, and Chanhassen, Minnesota, so it's kind of a distributed type of center. Our mission is all things water. So we concentrate on floods and flash floods, water quality, drought, soil moisture, water supply and low flow issues, uh, snowpack, and coastal total water level. As you might imagine, a lot of these things cross organizational and office boundaries, agency boundaries. So we have uh, links to National Ocean Service. We have links to a lot of the centers at uh, NSEP, whether it's Weather Prediction Center or Environmental Modeling Center and others. And we're always looking to figure out how we can strengthen those connections and leverage, basically, um, each other's work. The way I divided up this talk is it's roughly divided in half between near-term and future capabilities, and then also a couple slides on answering the standard set of questions that we've all kind of 
been going through today uh, that were issued to us a few days ago. So I'm going to start out with near-term capabilities. And the way we are tackling this is by spinning up a centralized water forecasting capability at the water center. This is taking the form of Wharf Hydro. And it's a bit of a misnomer. It's, you see Wharf right there, but we're not actually running Wharf. Um, we're not coupled to an atmospheric model. We're just simply using a hydrologic modeling framework, an uncoupled hydrologic modeling framework the way we have it configured called Wharf Hydro. The first version of this will be operational on the Cray in June of this coming year. And it will have several different configurations. It will have an hourly analysis, which will be simulating stream flow data and forced by observed precip. Also have some deterministic forecasts uh, forced by the HER and the GFS, and also some ensemble forecasts driven by the CFS out to 30 days. The main thrust of this model is to provide an unprecedented, unprecedented level of hydrologic uh, information, both in uh, coverage, density, and in basically the, the richness of the information. So one of our prime focuses will be hydrologic output, river channel discharge, or stream flow, as you might uh, typically hear it. The leap ahead here is that right now the Weather Service produces about three or 4,000 river forecasts at points across the country. And what we're doing is, in running this national model, we'll be making available forecast of discharge, for example, at 2.67 million uh, river segments or points across the country. Wharf Hydro also features a 250-meter grid across the country, and uh, this is used to basically route water uh, from across the surface and under the surface into those stream channels. So you'll have things available like excess water uh, that's flowing across the surface, and you also have subsurface flow available, too. We're running the NOAA MP model within Wharf Hydro, and this provides us good link to uh, NSEP EMC. This is going to be in a one kilometer conus plus grid, and what you get out of NOAA MP would be what you would expect out of the land surface model in terms of the typical heat fluxes, uh, snow variables, soil moisture, variables along those sorts of lines. And the way we're going to push out all of this data will basically be a three-pronged approach. We're going to disseminate it via a public-facing water center website, this will be a GIS-enabled uh, kind of um, configurable viewer. We're also going to have a data feed to the River Forecast Center so that they can ingest this data into their chip system. And NCO will be hosting our data on Nomads, too. So this slide is from Mike Eck. I've adapted it from him. And what I've done is I've inserted Warp Hydro down the bottom. You'll see it there, kind of next to all the other land surface uh, hydrology types of um, components. And what Mike has done is he's circled all the different uh, NOAA incarnations and the different models, and I've done the same thing with Warp Hydro. So we're going to be leveraging each other's development efforts as we move along through time here. And you'll see the arrows connecting Warp Hydro to all the forcing inputs that it needs, uh, the rapid refresh, the ER, uh, the CFS, and the GFS. So graphically, this is the type of increase in forecast coverage that we're looking at. On the left, we see a plot of a county that's pretty close to here, Tower County, Maryland, just a few miles north on 95. And it's the, it hosts the second largest community in Maryland, which is Columbia, Maryland. And it has about 300,000 people living in there. Now, unfortunately, the Weather Service doesn't provide any official river forecast within that county. When Wharf Hydro begins operations, we'll be offering about 300 or so forecast points within that, providing additional coverage um, and services. Bringing it even a bit more local, on the right side, we have a plot of the D.C. area. On the right, uh, the circle there is this building, NCWCP. And the nearest forecast point in our case is about 17 kilometers away, and it's for the Potomac River. Uh, now, just behind this building, there's a, a footpath that runs along a stream, uh, the northeast branch of the Anacostia River. It floods sometimes. It certainly causes damage sometimes. And right now, the... the uh, day-to-day -day river forecast that we would have to go on for taking a look at a uh, stream like that would be the Potomac River, which obviously is going to behave differently than other rivers around here. Once Wharf Hydro is up and running, just as an example, we would have a forecast point point uh, four kilometers away. It would be for that river, so just to kind of bring it close to home. These are just two example images of output from Wharf Hydro. These are sample national outputs, discharge on the left and correlation on the right. 
is a very rough preliminary plot. They're uncalibrated. They don't include the uh, stream flow data simulation that we have up and running now. And they also don't include um, uh, some of the uh, additional uh, calibration, oh, and regulation too. So they don't include reservoirs either, which we have now activated. That's one big difference in hydrology versus meteorology is the aspect of regulation. People have a habit of altering stream flow. There are very few natural streams in the country anymore. And so as you're trying to predict stream flow, you really need to get a good handle on regulation. Basically, what are the reservoirs doing? Where are people sending water through big diversions? Uh, things like that. So um, we have an initial take on that with version one of this model, and that's something that we'll iterate on year over year. So moving on, another near-term capability. So again, Warp Hydro will come in in June. This capability, which is the Snow Data Assimilation System, this has actually been running operationally since 03, and it's transitioning to the IDP platform in uh, FY16, so later this fiscal year. As the name implies, it's a snowpack model. It operates on a one-kilometer grid and produces analyses and forecasts of snow depth, density, uh, temperature, evaporation, water content, melt, Basically, everything and everything you need to get a handle on snowpack. And the reason that's important, especially out west, a lot of the water supply out there is snow melt driven. So they really need to have a good handle on you know, what the snow holdings are of the mountains, basically. And uh, there are other applications as well, and this system um, tries to serve those. The Hydrologic Ensemble Forecast <coughs> System, or HEFS, is another current capability. And this is operational at all 13 river forecast centers. So this is not something that the water center is running itself or that's running on WCOS, for example. So it differs from the previous two models um, I've talked about. But uh, what it does is it produces probabilistic forecast of stream flow at um, locations of the RFC's choosing. And a significant application is it's also used by New York City to optimize their water supply management operations. Right now, uh, Hendrick mentioned this earlier today, the Water Center is finalizing requirements uh, with EMC and uh, working with EMC and NCO um, on a plan for guest V12 reforecast to support operations of, of that. The other joint efforts with NSEF. So I've gone through current capabilities, but there are also um, ongoing near-term efforts with NSEF I wanted to highlight. One is with my deck group, uh, with the NLDAS project, and there we're trying to coordinate in terms of forcing generation and model verification. We're always going to have differences between our models and differences in our missions, but there are significant areas of overlap, and we don't want to ignore those, and we want to leverage them. Also, WPC. So we are currently investigating with them the potential for using their QPF uh, as forcing data into Warp Hydro. So that's something that's just beginning to spin up. All right, let me finish off here in terms of the out-year plan. Uh, along the bottom, you see basically two sustained efforts that just go forward in time. Um, we're informing water resource management through an improving forecast process. And down the bottom is another extremely important point. Again, sustained coordination with NSEF to make sure that um, we try and move um, as, uh, as kind of as closely as possible um, whenever, well, as close as possible whenever it's possible, but it's succinctly. The stair step you see here is a series of uh, overlapping five-year research and operations efforts. So the way to look at this is each block is a self-contained five-year effort. But you'll see that they build on each other and they overlap. So starting last year, that's when the water center basically came into existence and we began our centralized water forecasting effort, which again is work hydro. That's now in year two, and we're just beginning work on the FY16 initiative, which is a focus on flash flooded urban hydrology. As you then go through time, you see uh, year over year building in terms of um, programs and capabilities. We move to coastal total water level simulation efforts. That's with the Ocean Service and the Bensa. Uh, we then focus on drought and coast fire operations. And finally, in kind of, uh, down the road, we focus on water quality. All right, I'll wrap up with a couple slides on the questions that, uh, that we've all answered today. So what are the biggest challenges facing the water center? A lot of these are my, what you might imagine. Um, the availability of accurate, high-resolution forecasts and observed forcing data. That's probably common to a lot of different centers. Uh, so for us, we're trying to capture and be able to produce 
simulations across a wide variety of scales. So not just long-term water supply forecasts, but also very fine scale, neighborhood level scale, flash flood forecasts, for example. And what we need through that, for those applications, are um, accurate forcing data. How much rain is falling and where is it falling, for example, that really has a huge impact on our operations. Cross-boundary issues are also a challenge. So our boundary is big enough that we go past where the her ends and we kind of nudge our way into the RAP domain. And so when a rainfall system moves from the RAP domain down into the her domain, and we see that kind of in the emerged forcing that we get, it, it causes some issues, some disconnections. Lack of comprehensive validation data and also lack of the central repository for regulation information. So there, basically, the atmosphere's uh, verification effort is ahead of us, ahead of the hyd hydrologic verification effort. We need a more centralized repository for verification information that we can draw on to see, um, to perform comprehensive validation verification. Regulation is important. I touched upon this before. Again, reservoirs. How are they being operated in Maryland? What's going on in Colorado? We need to understand and know in real time what's going on with these transfers of water. Right now, there's no centralized source of that data, and that's something that the Water Center will be working on developing. And finally, coordinating across overlapping portions of NOAA. So we overlap quite a bit with other parts of NSEP, and again, uh, we have active ongoing efforts to try and uh, leverage each other's efforts, and I think we're doing quite well, and we'll continue those efforts. And two more slides. Basically, is the current amount of guidance available too much or too little? A bit of a funny answer, but it's both. There's a multitude of overlapping guidance products, which I think sometimes makes it a bit hard, a bit difficult to figure out which are the best combinations to use. But even given that big amount of guidance, sometimes some of our requirements are still unsatisfied. And what do we need in terms of models or products to meet our challenges in the next two, one to two years? Higher temporal spatial forcing data, so at least hourly, I'd say, to capture those fine events, like flash floods, for example, we really need to move away from looking at three or six hourly precip totals and look for the intense peaks that occur on hourly or sub-hourly scales. That's the type of forcing data we need in our model. We also need higher spatial resolution, medium range forecasts, so the GFS, for example. Ensemble high-res short-range forcing. We're using the HER model right now, and that's great, but we would really love to use an ensemble HER, for example, and uh, that would help us to better capture the uncertainties inherent in trying to predict convectively driven flooding events. Finally, uh, we forecast for supporting the hydrologic ensemble forecast system and eventually work hydro down the road. And uh, just a robust coordinated approach um, for forcing generation and hydrologic validation with NSEP. And that's my last slide. Thanks. What is the question? Or their, uh, their hydrologic ensemble forecasting work? Right. You know, I noticed it wasn't on your slides. Has that been part of your conversation? Sure, yeah. Uh, the RFCs have been using, they, they have a project where they use the analysis to do, help, with, help them with some of their QPF calibration. It's called uh, HEFs. Uh, is there any, I noticed it was on your slides. Is there any plans to address that issue? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things I touched on was that uh, there's ongoing pretty coordinated efforts with EMC right now, with Hendrix Group and um, the HEPS Group back at the Water Center. They've had several meetings trying to coordinate on what the GEPS V12 uh, reforecast configuration will be. I think they've made some really good strides on figuring that out. The very, the very short version of it is that in order not to break HEPS uh, with the V11 implementation, we keep just enough of V10 up and running to keep HEPS in the same uh, way of running. Uh, which gives us the time to do the proper reforecast for a V12. And so, uh, actually, uh, uh, both uh, <laughs> the Water Center and NSEP are briefing to Louis tomorrow morning early how, uh, how we're going on with that. And it is very likely that we're going to try and do uh, uh, a very high resolution uh, in terms of time uh, reforecast for V12 while we try to figure out how we can more smartly sample uh, the <laughs> extreme events 
so we can get a reforecast that is not homogeneously sampled in time, but has the proper type of input for these kind of things. And that's probably, I hope, but that's something we need to work out still, that for V13 and V14 and V15, by doing a much more a smart sampling of your reforecast, you can actually make it something that is uh, not as uh, as intrusive as the full reforecast we're going to do for 12 is going to be on our resources. Hey, that's great. When you're comfortable and ready, can you share that? Because at least with my Western Region HICs, this was their number one issue. Sure. I'll get it out to them. Thank you. Other questions, comments? No comments? Okay, I'd like to thank the... Um, the speakers. Uh, they certainly kept us right on time. Uh, we have one final um, speaker, uh, Hendrik. Supposed to wrap it up first. Anybody hungry? So, I mean, we had a really good set of, uh, of uh, session chairs that kept us on time. Uh, I'm going to do something that I'm not known for. I'm actually going to get us ahead of time. So, uh, yeah, there's a always a need for a little bit of a wrap-up, just to do a step back. So today was a little bit of a traditional production suite review. Last year we said we want to do it a little bit different. We do it a little bit different now. We were really waiting for the UMAC uh, uh, first bits and pieces to come through before we wanted to really change the way we're doing business. So this morning it was a little shorter, it was a little bit sweeter, it was a little bit more to the point, and it was not that by PowerPoint by everybody. And so we really made uh, good, uh, good uh, progress there. Next year, we're probably going to do it even more simple, but we'll discuss that later in this week. The uh, center reviews, we did do very differently, and I don't know how you guys think about it, but I'm very satisfied by what I've seen, because we've basically made a stride towards actually using <coughs> this meeting to much more systematically look at what the requirements for the forecast centers are. And if we look at the people who are our primary evaluators of our operational systems, uh, those are for a big part our forecast centers. And we've had some issues over the last year with kind of rapidly changing uh, requirements that we have in, uh, for our models because our models get used more and more widely. So we've had issues with that. And so it was very nice to see, uh, to see <coughs> all the centers make this step forward towards uh, so it's uh, uh, just taking, taking a step back, looking at what do I really need, what do I really use all these different systems for. And uh, I know Jeff Craven already started a, uh, I think it was Jeff Craven, started a uh, Google Doc on that. And I will get back to all you guys to, to get more detailed information on that over the next few weeks. Uh, but if you really look at the oversight here, the, the, the big gorilla in the room uh, was not Ricky, but it was UMAC. And... Uh, that was kind of a unique thing to do. Uh, I mean, the fact that uh, in all these years we've done 20 years of these, re well, actually this is 21st year, so that's why it's not a big party. But we've done, uh, <coughs> done 20 years of these reviews, and in all these, all these years we've never really done any systematic reviewing of it. So the fact that we've done this UMAC review, or I should say the UMAC committee has done the review, is a real, real big issue. And I'm personally very happy with it for two reasons. First of all, if I, as the EMC director, try to uh, prune down the production suite, I will find somebody for every single thing I do who does not agree with, who does not want me to cut that one product or simplify the system uh, in one way or the other. Having a, a really high-level group who has done a really bang-up job on systematically looking at what we need to do strategically as well as tactically, I, I'm really very, very grateful for that, that having happened. And I'm being one of the persons who really pushed for getting that done. And I'm really happy with it because the findings from UMAC align pretty much with the, some of the thoughts we had ourselves. Some are a little bit more better articulated. Some are a little smarter than what I thought. But, but we, I hope you got the message this morning that it's not just uh, Bill, as the NSEP director, wants us to move forward. Having a UMAC committee that has one plan, and then, oh, yeah, everybody else goes, like, that nice plan, let's go on with business as usual. We really want to go this way. We really want to go forward. So with that, the center overviews gave us a, a very good uh, 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 next step 
to start building towards this uh, strategic plan. And then uh, the good thing is that uh, you have these meetings to learn things. And I have at least one thing that I've learned or enforced that I didn't think of that strongly yet before. We've always said one of the key parts of working at NEMS and, and, and one of the key parts for going to unified modeling is a focus on a physics driver, not just on the, not just on the, on the die core. And the one thing that stood out for me from, uh, from the service centers particularly is that we're really hurting for the fact that our global physics really do not work properly for what we want to do on the convection scale. And so we already have this commitment to have a much bigger focus on the physics, but the one thing that I've took away from that is that if we want to think even beyond what we're doing with energy GPS, the idea of going towards a more unified physics system and the physics uh, and, and putting the proper attention on the global physics to get the right profiles, the right boundary layer, the, the right uh, uh, sensible weather elements is something that I'm taking home with me tonight and think about how we can accelerate that probably a little bit faster. And apart from that, I'm really, I want to once more thank the UMAC people, and I really want to uh, say how happy I am with the fact that I'm actually seeing so much alignment and potential alignment, and so little at the moment, uh, we'll see if that changes or not, uh, fighting about the exact little details we're doing, that I'm, I'm very happy with, with, with where we're going. And I'm really looking forward to the challenge of, uh, of uh, getting this production suite uh, a lot more streamlined, uh, uh, a lot uh, simpler, and a lot more uh, nimble in order to be able to do actually meaningful across the board uh, improvements of the science behind it and therefore the products that we generate and therefore the requirements we satisfy. And uh, that's going to be the next two days. So I hope we haven't tired you out too much. I hope you're all going to be here the next two days because we have lots and lots of discussions in the next two days to go forward on that. And unless anybody has something that they really want to uh, uh, delay other people with for getting dinner, other than Mike. Um, I just like to, would like to thank uh, Mary Hart for her efforts in uh, keeping the um, PowerPoints going. I've done my part. I promise not to touch the computers ever again in the meeting. <laughs> Very good. Okay, at 8.30 tomorrow. Yeah, we're starting again at 8.30 tomorrow. Um, it oh. It right up here. Dan? Yeah, yeah, well, today's stuff is all out there on the FTP site and the Google Drive. I've got, I've started getting some of the ones for tomorrow, but I don't have all of them yet, so they will get out there. And I'd like to thank Central Region for letting us use their webinar. Yes. Definitely. Thank you very much for that. Um, dinner tomorrow, Franklin's. If you, when you signed up or registered, if you checked the box for Franklin's, great. If you didn't and you changed your mind, I will probably just ask for a show of hands tomorrow right before the break so that uh, Tammy can then let uh, Franklin's know what we have in terms of head count. Yeah. So um, let's see. Well, what time is the uh, break tomorrow? 10.10. Well, right at, right, at, right, right at the break, then I can run upstairs and give her the numbers. So anyway, um, I think I saw another hand go up or something. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, see every, thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow at 8.30. Thanks.